Namane ne parte fide in expedita sancti. Amen. Talk about Saint Joan of Arc, whose feast day it should be today. Uh, she was put on the universal calendar, uh, but then taken off, um, which which um, uh, burns me up, right? Um, so, St. Joan of Arc, uh, born in 1412 and died in 1431. Um, she, was one, she is one of the most widely known saints in the world, uh, whose face day, as I mentioned, is not in the universal calendar. And she is famous for uh, leading uh, her, um, her army, uh, her, her country, uh, French troops, into battle during the Hundred Years' War, and that was a dynastic dispute between the French and the English royalty. Uh, so she was born to a poor peasant family in Domremy, France, and she was very pious as a little, little girl, and she would be often seen uh, in the church devoutly kneeling, saying her prayers. She also had a devotion and a love for the poor. Um, and at the age of 13 is when she began hearing her heavenly voices, as she put it, uh, these voices uh, speaking to her. And she later identified them as St. Michael the Archangel, uh, Catherine of Alexandria, and St. Margaret of Antioch. Now, all three of those would be, um, uh, uh, Catherine of Alexandria and Margaret of Antioch are both virgin martyrs, and of course we know St. Michael the Archangel. Why those three particular voices? Well, we will see, right? Those three voices, the lives of those saints, if you know them, display particular virtues, and, 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 and um, St. Joan would, would need every single one of those virtues that those, those, uh, those saints whose voices she was hearing uh, had to offer her. Um, <clears throat> so, she, so she starts hearing these voices at age 13, and by the time she is 16 years old, it became clear these voices were urging her to rise up and save France from invasion by the English. Now, you know, we, we know the story. We know that she is successful, right? That she goes and she wages battle and so on. But let's think about this for a minute. A 16-year-old peasant girl hears voices telling her to go save her country. Go, go join the military, lead, not just join, lead, become the general and, and save your country. That, that's impossible, right? If, if any 16-year-old girl here told me that, I would, I would call a psychologist. Like, you're, you're, you're crazy. Like, this is imp absolutely impossible. People today, still today, people try to say that St. Joan of Arc was schizophrenic. And we'll see there's evidence why that is not the case. Uh, obviously not the case, but there's, there's evidence that shows, um, we'll, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. But just the impossibility of that, the impossibility of this actually happening or being true. It, 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 so she travels to the military commander of a nearby town with one of her cousins and asks him to take her to see the king. I mean, the audacity of this, the take me a peasant, I'm gonna, I have to go see the king. So what does a commander do? The commander doesn't even respond to Joan of Arc. The commander tells her cousin, take this girl home and see that she's soundly whipped. Now get out of here, right? Which, which is, 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 that's kind of the proper response. Uh, so she goes back, but the voices become insistent. In fact, the voices start threatening her. So she's like, oh. so she goes back a month later, and this time she predicted a great military defeat for the French. I don't know how miraculous that is because they were getting defeated all the time anyways. <laughs> uh, but anyways, three days later, it was confirmed. So it was more the case that she predicted it like at that time, right? So uh, it was confirmed. The military leader believed her and so sent her to the king. So when she arrives, she, 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 she gets to the king. And this is already a, a um, uh, you know, would say, um, not miraculous, but, but un unlikely. So she arrived, and the king had disguised himself. He had dressed somebody else up as the king, and he was just, a, a, you know, a, a courier. Um, well, St. Joan of Arc, never having seen him before, and, and she has no idea what the king looks like, um, she, she picks him out. She completely looks past the actual, the person dressed up as king, and she goes right up to this apparent just, you know, anybody, and, and kneels down and addresses him as king and starts speaking to him. Uh, so that, that um, inclined them to believe her. Also the fact that she told the king uh, a secret that only he would know. And, and he did. So uh, they, they, they are convinced by this. And, um, and, and this, is, this is kind of one of the things where, 
you know, to me, that, that is convincing uh, of, and, and should be convincing to others as well, that St. Joan of Arc pos ha was not mentally ill in any capacity. I mean, uh, mir miraculous leadership aside, right, and, and her brilliant responses, um, the Dauphin at that time, uh, the Dauphin, uh, he was not the king himself. He was the, uh, um, the going to be king, the boy king, that they had yet to be crowned as king due to all of the, the turmoil. But the Dauphin, uh, his father was uh, Charles the uh, Seventh. Was his father? Now Charles the Seventh had another name, which was Charles the Mad. Uh, so, so the Dauphin's own father was crazy. Uh, for one thing, he believed that he was Saint George, and another thing, he believed he was made of glass. And to take to protect himself, because he was made of glass, he had iron rods sewn in his clothing so that he wouldn't break. Uh, another time, he was with some of his nobles. They were approaching one of his own castles. The king uh, suddenly believed that it was an ambush. He drew his sword, stabbed one of the men next to him, and then charged off into the forest. So this is what the prince, this is what the crown prince had grown up with. This was his own father, so he was very well acquainted with mental illness. So he would have been able to spot that in St. Joan of Arc immediately. But that's not the case, right? So he was. So there's another reason why uh, why the the, wor the world's um, demand, and that's that's all the world has. The world cannot deny the facts of Saint Joan of Arc, uh, but they they just will not. They refuse to admit the miracle. They cannot believe it, and so they fall back on uh, mental illness, even though all the evidence is against it. But we've seen we've seen that the modern world does not follow the science. The modern world does not want to hear about science. The modern world does not care about science or facts or logic or reason, as we're seeing with the, 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 the transgender nonsense is just the most egregious example. Uh, but, but all throughout, I, I mean, I could go on. This is not a Friday night sermon, so I won't, I won't get, get crazy. Um, anyway, the, the, this, all the evidence is in, in supporting that this is true. Um, okay, where am I here? Um, the king. So she tells the king he must take Orleans, a city of great importance, and afterwards he is to be crowned king in Reims. Um, so they, they, give her, they give her charge of an army and, and just, you know, you can imagine people would be thinking like, this, this is crazy. What do, you, what do you think is going on here? She would have been, you know, the joke of, of the army. Some 16, 17-year-old girl is going to lead us into battle. Uh, well, she did. And what's amazing is that if for, for a peasant girl, maybe she knew how to ride a horse, but to ride a war horse? I mean, that takes years of training. I mean, war horses are big and powerful, and, and they're, they're used to, like, the, 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 the sounds of battle. If you can't command that horse, uh, you know, which takes an incredible amount of skill and strength, you can't ride that into battle, and you can't not ride a war horse into battle because any other horse would, 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 wouldn't be able to do it, right? They have to be specially trained. How did St. Joan of Arc do this? She didn't have any training. She didn't know how to do this. That is miraculous itself, just the fact that she was able to, to accomplish this. Um, so she rides in the battle, and, and she has um, uh, kind of a couple of, um, so many good things I have to skip over, but we'll be here forever. Um, two quotes. She says, uh, I am not afraid I was born for this, is when they asked her if she was afraid to go into battle. I Absolutely no fear. I was born for this. And her battle cry was, forward boldly. Uh, forward boldly. She was so frustrated at the cowardice, the timidity, and the stupidity of the French generals. I mean, this is a peasant girl with no training in war, and she can just see with common sense, this is ridiculous. You, need to, you, you, you men are supposed to be bad uh, warriors, and, and, and you're so cowardly, you're so afraid. Um, so very frustrating for her, but, but for two years, she did this. Uh, she she uh, um, won victory after victory after victory. Uh, the, the, the English were just co were completely on the run. Um, she was on the verge of, of a complete victory uh, until finally she was wounded in battle and then shortly thereafter captured. Um, in fact, she was, she was captured. Part of the reason she was captured is um, uh, 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 due, due to a uh, traitor. There was a French traitor who ended up selling her, uh, selling her out to the English. 
And despite the fact that she was responsible for uh, um, um, completely turning the tide for France, for she got the, the prince to be crowned king, she had completely won everything for the French, and what happened after she was captured? Nothing. The French king didn't even try to ransom. No money, no exchange of prisoners, just did absolutely nothing. Now that lets you know the, the, um, the corruption in the French court and the, the um, contemptible nature of the king and his own courtiers. Um, in that um, when you are scheming for something for yourself, you don't care how much somebody else helps you. In fact, I bet you uh, what, what the advisors to the king said, um, you know, this girl, she could easily defeat you and turn on you and have herself crowned queen or whatever like that. If they knew anything about human character, they would know she would never, ever do that. That's not what she wanted. But in the mind of, of what is it, um, you know, in the mind of the wicked, uh, the, the, the guilty man fleeth when no one pursues. Uh, so they n most likely saw the, her capture as a chance of like, oh, great, fantastic, one of your enemies has been taken out, one of your rivals, somebody who could have threatened you. So they completely sold her out. Uh, she, was, she, was, she went into captivity, and uh, as, as we know, and she was put on a mock, a sham trial by the church in England, and she was eventually burned at the stake as a heretic. Um, you know, which, for which reason I say that she is the patron saint of those who have been abused by the church, because she was. She's the patron saint of those who, who suffered at the hands of evil churchmen. Uh, because, in, in fact, after her death, uh, uh, the Inquisition in 1456, with the permission of Pope Calixtus III, examined her trial and debunked the charges against her, proclaimed her innocent, and declared her a martyr. And now, if, if, when, when St. Joan's Feast is actually celebrated, her, the colors are white. Even though she was, burned, her, she was burned, her remains were burned three more times and then thrown in the river because they didn't want any of her, of, her, of her relics to remain. So she was killed by the church, but how do you have a martyr who is a martyr because of the church? How do you have that? So her feast day is white. Um, but, you know, when she was in captivity, she, just, she displayed, and I, I mentioned the, um, those three saints, Catherine of Alexandria, Margaret of Antioch, and uh, 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 St. Michael the Archangel, uh, all three of them helped her. Obviously, St. Michael the Archangel, mighty in battle. That's that he was inspiring her with, with the military uh, abilities. Um, Catherine of Alexandria, or, or uh, Margaret of Antioch, was very brave and very bold in, in resisting and in, in willing to suffer death and, and imprisonment and torture and so on, which she did. She suffered all those things, and St. Joan needed that in captivity. But then also St. Catherine of Alexandria was a brilliant philosopher uh, in her own time. And so that's, this is where these, um, when St. Joan of Arc was in captivity, she kept being, they tried to trip her up with all these theological questions, and she gave brilliant responses. And this is where certainly um, uh, 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 Catherine of Alexander was helping her. And I must say, by this time, her voices went silent. It wasn't like she was hearing things and, oh, say this, say that. They were completely silent. Uh, but certainly inspiring her from within. Remember the other day, Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, and our Lord said to her, um, I'm going to remove you know, the feeling of my grace. My grace will still be there, but you're not going to feel it. It's going to feel like I'm far away. And so you see that with St. Joan in captivity. She's not hearing her voices. She feels desolate. She tries to escape. It doesn't work. You know, she's brought back. Uh, she's, in, she's dejected, but her answers show that she's getting heavenly assistance to respond. Uh, among them, she was asked once if she, if she knew she was in a state of grace, and this is one of those pharisaical things where they try to trap Christ. If he says this, he's trapped. If he says this, he's trapped. We got him either way. There's no way out of it. There's always a way out of it. So she was asked if she knew she was in a state of grace, and, and there, there's a trap to answering yes or no. She answers, if I am not, may God put me there. If I am, may he keep me there. Brilliant, answered her, answered the, uh, that, that perfectly. She was asked again whether God hated the English or not. She replied, of God's love or hatred for the English, I know nothing, but I do know that they will all be thrown out of France except those who die there. Uh, she was asked again a complicated question about the identity of Christ and our Lord, and she replied, about Jesus Christ and the church, I simply know that they are one and the same, and we shouldn't complicate the matter. 
And you have the Roman Inquisition in the 1500s going over these questions and her answers, and they find that she's com completely exonerated her and declare her a martyr. So for somebody to have that kind of brilliance to, to, to uh, um, avoid theological error when that's what they're, they're designed to do, that's the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. That's the saints helping you. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, now before she died, it was, uh, she was, she was um, uh, burned at the stake. But prior to being uh, uh, executed, it, the, she was allowed to go to confession, she, and she did receive Holy Communion. So that was a great grace from God, giving her that, that final viaticum, we could say. And she was given a, a crucifix uh, as she was burned, and she held it aloft, and she rep uh, repeated the name of Jesus as she was being burned, over and over again. Jesus, 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 until um, uh, her life was taken. Uh, so uh, despite this, despite all this, this incredible example, this undeniable uh, um, grace of God in her life, uh, she was not declared uh, beatified until 1909 and not canonized until 1920 by Benedict XV. And I guarantee you it's because of that, the political aspect. Uh, first of all, just the, the French are uh, difficult to deal with. I mean, the English are too. And you have those French and English clerics. There's, you know, bad blood, whatever. Um, also, just how do we declare somebody a saint who has been martyred by the church? How does that happen? In any case, she finally gets canonized in 1920. Her feast is finally inserted into the calendar and then it's taken out only a few years later. I think in the 1950s, her feast is removed from the universal calendar. Um, under the, the, the specious reason of there are too many French saints. Give me a break. Have you seen how many Italians there are in the church calendar? Um, so, so somebody said, you know, St. Joan of Arc got burned by the church twice uh, by getting her, her feast day taken out. So she needs to have it inserted back in, and, and eventually that's coming. But um, as I said, she, she's a model for uh, victims of the church, uh, those who suffer at the hands of clerics. Um, and also, uh, she's the perfect um, fish-out-of-water story. If, if you feel like you don't fit or um, like, you know, I'm not in the right place, sometimes God chooses the precise and exact opposites to accomplish his will because everybody is failing who should be doing something about it. Uh, men failed of, of the, the, in, in France. The men failed, so God chose a woman. The adults failed, so God chose a child. The nobility failed, God chose a peasant. The clergy failed, God chose a laywoman. The educated failed, he chose an ignorant person. The rich failed, he chose a poor person. The military failed, he chose a civilian. She only had one thing in common, she was French. Right? That, is how, that, is, that is proof that this was God behind it because the opposite uh, in every category, somebody who shouldn't have any qualifications, is precisely the one who rises up and saves France in its hour of need. So we shouldn't be uh, uh, surprised or afraid. The fact that every, absolutely everybody in charge in the church, in the world, in politics these days is absolutely failing and, and, and in complete disarray and everybody's a coward and everybody's incompetent, we shouldn't fear. Because you look around at all the places where leaders should be, you're not going to find any. It's going to be one from the, from the unlikeliest of sources, the, the person you would least expect. That's how you know God is doing it. So, um, what a great saint, right? For, for this time and for every time. I, I, I derive so much uh, inspiration from St. Joan of Arc every year. I, I never get tired. Like, I, I could talk about this for, for, for a long time. Uh, but because there's so much there, so I encourage you, uh, do n learn about the saints, and, and there is so much to learn and so much to be inspired by and comforted by from their stories. And what are their stories? It was difficult for her. It was difficult to leave her home. She said when she was out, out there in the army, I want to be back at my spinning wheel. I don't want to be here, but she was there. And, 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 that, and, and that, that life of the saints is hard, and she was imprisoned, and she it was desolate, and she had no consolation from God. And that hard life of hers gives us comfort and gives us hope. Because when our life is hard, when we feel desolate, when we feel like everything is wrong, that could be precisely God working a miracle in us, in our life, in the world. We just don't know. Uh, so take inspiration from this. Uh, pray to the saints, and especially let us ask St. Joan of Arc for her intercession today when many people are suffering, even as she did, at the hands of corrupt churchmen. May God bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.